think that was like a fraternity fee lemon or something like that. I'm not going to say anything funny tonight because you people. Yeah, We're tough crowd. You be tough. Or use my jokes as well. Say something funny. <laughs> I want to read you guys uh, Catherine Rich's letter real quickly before we read our text tonight just to uh, give you a little update. And also, uh, Brother Rich Rich's funeral will be tonight. It's tomorrow there, but tonight they're 13 hours different than us. So it is... Midnight. It's at exactly midnight. Okay, we'll be the funeral. So if you'd like to watch it on Facebook Live, then just stay up till midnight watch it. I think Facebook Live normally records things as well, does it not? So if you don't watch it live, you can probably watch it on the live. Please be praying for the Rich family. And I'll just be honest with you, it's just so bittersweet when someone like Brother Rich or Rich goes to be with the Lord. It's just, it's one of those things where you just think of the folks that are near to him and all of the loss that they have as far as the person that they, that they lost. And uh, you think of the, the gaping ministry halls that have to be filled. The Brother Rich, he, he finished the course. He kept the faith. And there is just something so... I just tell you what, encouraging and thrilling to me. Uh, I, I just he's, a, he's an example. And there aren't a lot of examples like that. A lot of times we're disappointed when we see men that want to serve the Lord. Some years ago... I suppose it would be about maybe 13, 14 years ago, I had the privilege of meeting him for the first time. And I'd seen him before because Brother Rich would come on campus. This would have been when I was in seminary at, in, at Pensacola. And one of the things that he was pretty well known for among all the guys in seminary was he's always grabbing a Bible college student and taking them into the bookstore and buying them books or buying them Bible software or giving them ministry tools. And he always wanted to talk about, well, this will help you study or this will help with whatever. And if you ever talk to him for a minute, he was always telling you about somebody new that he'd known or met, a young person, that was either going to answer the call to go to Japan uh, for the ministry or was going to visit Japan, but somebody that God was working in. He was one of those, uh, one of the older mentor type preachers that just latched on to young people and just put encouragement into them, just really encouraged their hearts. And so... I, he certainly would have done that and just been a personal friend to me. A dear, dear friend. And I remember one of the first times sitting down and having dinner with him. And they had planted a church. They established it and they moved, moved on. And they were raising support again to go back and plant another church. And really he was at an age at that time where a lot of missionaries had been on the field. You know, when you've been on the field for 30 years, you're pretty much ready to retire and come off. And he's raising support to go back and plant another church. And one of the questions that you ask is, what about your age? You know, how long are you going to be able to be there? How long are you going to be able to serve and minister? And, uh, of course, he had bright hopes for uh, people coming and helping and that sort of thing. But he told me, he said, well, I just want to serve God until I die. I want to be buried in Japan. And, uh, you know, that's the way it ought to be when we serve the Lord. It, it is somewhat rather troublesome oftentimes that people that see themselves as servants of the Lord see a tenure or a time that they serve God. They, they don't just give God their lives. They say, I'm just going to serve until the Lord takes me. And that's one of the beauties of, of uh, the Brother Rich's ministry is just the way that he encouraged and he finished. And the way that God's really set things into place. You know, in some ways, it's kind of uh, Brother Michael, it's, it's a big push for him. He's going to have to pastor that church now. He's going to have to take the leadership. But I think it was time. There's time for that. And it's just amazing God's timing and the way God does things and how sweet and precious that is and how precious in the sight of the Lord's death of His saints. I want to read you Catherine Rich's letter. I'm sure some of you are wondering, well, now what about Mrs. Rich? What, what are her plans? Uh, here's a letter from her. Dear friends, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Psalm 116, 15. I'm writing to share the sudden and unexpected home going of my beloved husband. He passed away last night, September 28th, in the hospital here in Japan. He was admitted to the ICU the night before with great stomach pain. The next morning, he had a heart attack and his heart stopped. The doctors were able to resuscitate him after 20 minutes, but his brain had suffered damage and he was in a coma. He was surrounded by his family, Michael, April, 
Abigail and I, church members, and two Japanese pastor friends. We cried together, prayed together, and sang praise to the Lord. Many expressed their gratitude to Pastor Rich. The doctor said he would probably pass away in the evening. The Lord took him peacefully home at 10.22 p.m. We thank you for all your prayers. God has wonderfully answered, and we have great peace and comfort. The Lord is so good, and you're a blessing to us. Rich has been very busy preaching and teaching right up to the time he went home. We love doing it and seeing God change people's lives through his word. We are so thankful that Michael will become the pastor of the church with April at his side. I surely could not have dreamed all that God would do since he called me to come to Japan when I was 13. Uh, God, I don't think she went to Japan when she was 13. That's when she answered the call to go to Japan. Uh, God has blessed me with 44 wonderful years serving with Rich here in Japan. After talking with my home church pastor, uh, Mission, Michael, and April, and seeking God's will, I know God wants me to continue as a missionary and serve Him here in Japan. This morning, the Lord led me again to Matthew 28, 19, and 20, and confirmed once again His call on my life to continue as a missionary to the Japanese people. With your continued prayers and support, and God's strength and guidance, I will continue serving the Lord here at Faith Baptist Church in Saga, Japan. Please pray that God will greatly use me in reaching the Japanese people. Rich's funeral is being held on Monday, October 2nd, at Chofu Baptist Temple, Chofu, Japan. This is the church we attended while going to language school when we first came to Japan. The graveside service will be held at a Christian cemetery the following morning, 10 o'clock, in Fukushima. A memorial fund has been set up for the needs of our church, Faith Baptist Church in Saku, Japan. Any funds should be sent to Central Missionary Clearinghouse, P.O. Box 21928, Houston, Texas, and marked for Richard Rich Memorial Fund. Uh, thank you so much for your prayers and support, and I know you'll be praying for me. God bless you all. Serving the risen Lord in the land of the rising sun, Kathy Rich. So I'll plan on this Wednesday night having a special memorial offering for Richard Rich. And if you would just pray and, and to make preparations for that, we will have a memorial fund for the Rich family. What an encouragement they have been and uh, how wonderful it is to just have faithful people serving the Lord, preaching the gospel, and just staying true, unchanging, just serving the Lord. And Brother Rich is one of, those, one of those dear saints. And his dear wife, what a sweetheart. And... Uh, most of us have not gone through that separation of losing a spouse. And we just cannot relate uh, to what it is. I've, I've watched it. I've, I've spoken with so many people. I've described the way it feels. And it's what they tell me is it's just so lonely. It's just you just feel so alone. And so she's going to need God's grace and God's strength. And it certainly would be a help if anyone would do anything just to reach out and let her know she that they that they care. And one of the things that oftentimes happens when you lose somebody is that first month or so, first couple of months, people are there. But then about after six months it seems as though, you know, you're just really alone and it really hits you. So you maybe uh, want to set set something on your calendar, a timer that would just tell you to periodically reach out uh, to Catherine, write her a kind letter or note, let her know you're praying for her and that you appreciate the ministry and what God is doing. Uh, with with her and using her you know, to encourage her and just to stay on. And it's just wonderful when your heart's where you're at, how that God just gives you peace and it gives her a vision. That's a lot of difficult questions that they've had to answer this past week. And I think that the Lord is evidently at work in their lives. Well, let's read in Philemon. And we were, we're going to just read uh, verses 1 through 6 this evening because that's because that's what I, I decided. <laughs> Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy our brother, and to Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may be effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. So, Father, I pray that this evening, that as we look at this prayer, uh, that Paul is praying for Philemon and for Archippus and for uh, Appia and for all the people. Uh, in the church that's in his house. God, I pray that we would see the example of how this letter's written, the tone, the manner of it, and we would learn by it how that we ought to respond to adverse situations, to things 
that sometimes challenge us or to which we could really go either way with. And I pray that we would see the example of this now. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think most of you know this letter, this letter to Philemon. Uh, it's, it has an introduction to it. And uh, I want to point out a couple of things. One of the things we know is that the content that we're going to see in the letter is that Paul is writing to Philemon particularly about the matter concerning his runaway slave Onesimus. Onesimus, his slave, has run away and probably uh, did great damage in his household to him in a personal way when he left. I don't know if Onesimus stole things. He certainly... Uh, we don't know the circumstances under which Onesimus became Philemon's slave. Sometimes people sold themselves as slaves because of the circumstances that they're in. Maybe he owed a great debt and he would have been in a great deal of trouble and so Philemon bought him out of trouble in, in exchange for his services or what, whatever the circumstances of that were. It certainly was a time period that is very different than it is now when we don't have indentured or we don't have, uh, you don't have indentured servants and we don't have slaves. And by the way, we should. We oughtn't to. And Paul really doesn't go there as far as the appeal goes, probably because I think of the legal ramifications of it. But Paul takes a much higher ground uh, in responding to Philemon when he's trying to have his slave um, restored back to him. He's trying to make things right between Philemon and Onesimus. Now, let me just say this: uh, this is this is not a controversial passage of the scriptures. Nothing controversial about it, but it's helpful. And it's very, very enlightening. And so, uh, Philemon would certainly have had recourse against Onesimus. Very, very probably uh, things worse than prison that he could have had uh, for Onesimus because of whatever crimes Onesimus had committed along with stealing himself and whatever damage that he'd done. Uh, Paul has met up with Onesimus, and Paul is in prison uh, when he meets with Onesimus. So you wonder the circumstances how Onesimus came to run into Paul. The Bible doesn't expressly say that Onesimus was in prison or that he was incarcerated or anything like that. Uh, Paul certainly had some liberties, had some other people surrounding him and with him. So, but it's it's just Paul's in, in Rome. He's a prisoner in Rome and he bumps into somebody that they know in common. It's really interesting. Uh, I can't remember who it was. I remember being 13 years old from Kansas and uh, being in New York City and my dad bumping into somebody that knew somebody that he knew. In other words, oh, you know so-and-so. They got talking they both knew the same guy somehow. It's a long ways away from the two places. There are, and you're always finding out it's a small world, don't you? Mm -hmm. For instance, you can't go anywhere in the world without meeting someone that knows uh, Brother Larry Pieri or Brother Charlie Salcedo. And that's pretty much almost like, I'm serious, it's like, you know, it, you want to find common ground with somebody, you just can't find it, you just, just kind of drop a name, you know. You ever heard of Larry Pieri? You know, and you might have common ground, you know. And if that doesn't work, then try the, you know, the humdinger, and that's drop the Salcedo line. You know, you ever heard of a guy whose middle name is Alfonso? And I'd be like, Alfonso, you know, Charlie Salcedo. Oh, Charlie Salcedo, yeah. Yeah, I know him, or I know someone that knows him, or whatever. And then you got a little common ground. Well, this is rather much of a coincidence. I'm being silly about that, but it's rather much of a coincidence that Paul is in prison at Rome, and he bumps into a fellow by the name of Onesimus, who coincidentally has done great injury to a good friend of Paul's, Philemon, who Paul, later in the letter, uh, explains actually owes him a big debt. So he runs into somebody who owes Philemon a big debt, and Philemon coincidentally owes Paul a big debt. Now, perhaps they're different kinds of debts, but Philemon is indebted to Paul, Onesimus is indebted to Philemon, and Paul pulls us out at the end in the letter. But the first thing we see in this letter is the way that it's written. I am not one to encourage uh, open letters so much per se. Okay, you know what I'm talking about? In other words, you could you could call a guy up or you could send him an email or send him a text, but instead you're going to write him an open letter and let everybody know publicly that you're rebuking him. And that isn't the, the tone of this letter at all, actually. This is a letter to Philemon, but it is a letter to Philemon along with Appiah 
and along with Archippus, along with the church that's in his house. And so it's evident that Philemon at least, at least hosts an assembly of believers, but he may even be the pastor of the church that's in his house. Uh, so we don't know exactly what, exactly what that situation is, but Philemon certainly uh, has people that the letter is addressed to. In other words, Paul is very, very expressly and very, very kind words saying, uh, this is going to be a public matter if it isn't. In other words, this is something that you know can't really be kept a secret. What Onesimus has done is done publicly, and his appeal is also a public appeal. And so this isn't something that Philemon can respond wrong to and sweep it under the carpet and nobody will know how it's responded to. And that really is the tone as Paul begins. And Paul begins by, of course, as he always should, by encouraging Philemon and praising him for things that are wonderful. Uh, first of all, he, 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 he gives him a blessing, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know what the time elapse is from the time that Onesimus has disrupted the household, but uh, perhaps Onesimus was the cause of there not being peace, and so there's an express need to pray for peace for uh, Paul. So he says, grace to you and peace. And then he goes on to say, I thank God making mention of thee always in my prayers. Now here Paul mentions the proximity of their relationship. In other words, Philemon is not someone that is a casual acquaintance that he's bumped into once or twice or that he's met or had an impact on, but he doesn't really know. Philemon is someone that Paul expressly, uh, expressly articulates that he prays for him always. Make, I mention you always in my prayers. God Philemon, take care of Philemon. God this for Philemon, that for Philemon. He prays for Philemon. Uh, do you have anyone that prays for you? You know, if you're the kind of person that prays for people or likes people to pray for you, you ought to pick someone that you think nobody prays for and pray for them. You want to be a friend to somebody? Pray for your friend. Pray for someone. Just, just find somebody and pray for them. You know, there is nothing to me that is more valued that anyone can do for me than to pray for me. And that's just, that's just the truth. It's a fact. Hey, Jonathan, you find it? Is that where you want to be? All right, that's good. All right, so there's nothing that anybody can do for me. I'll be honest with you. You want to say, Pastor, I want to do something for you. And pray for me. I mean, really sincerely pray for me. Pray for me. You pray for me, you'll start watching me more closely, and you'll see a lot of things that I need to be prayed for about if you just observe carefully and closely. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I, it's funny, but, it's, but it's, it's really the honest truth. If you watch me closely, you'll see, man, that guy needs some prayer. He needs some things in his life that God, he just needs God to deal with him or God to intervene in his life or whatever. Don't play pray in precatory prayers unless you ask my permission first. Okay? But, <laughs> or my wife's permission. Just think of my wife if you pray for God to kill me or something like that. Even if that's what I need. Okay, so Char I didn't know much about imprecatory prayers, but Charlie went and instructed all her people on how to do it. And so I'm a little bit scared now. I got a little more fear than I used to have just because of Charlie messing around with our people in Sunday school class teaching them to imprecatory prayers. So I didn't know what the word imprecatory prayer meant most of my life. But Charlie does. You want to know about it. He's a mean guy, I'm telling you. Anyway, uh, but seriously, on a serious note, to pray for somebody honestly. Is the, it's a real demonstration of your friendship. I mean, honestly, if somebody really prays for you, they are your friend. And that's just a fact. If somebody really goes to the Lord on your behalf and they pray for you, they are your friend. And so that's the first thing Paul points out. So I make mention of you always in my prayers. You tell me something like that and you're about to tell me anything you want to, I'm going to listen to you because at least uh, if... if, if I mean, Paul's not a liar. He has a good reputation, not being a liar. And he said, I pray for you all the time. And so now, if I'm Philemon, I'm saying, okay, that, that means something to me. Now, Paul is not playing a political game. He's not writing the perfect letter to manipulate Philemon to produce the result that he wants. But he's being smart about it. He's being intelligent about it. So I thank God making mention of thee always in my prayers. And then he mentions a second thing that's a positive about their friendship. He said, Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus, 
And then notice the inclusive word in the last phrase, and toward all saints. Toward all saints. <laughs> now Philemon previously was covered regarding all saints because Onesimus was not a saint. Okay, so Philemon, you love all saints. Now I'm about to introduce you to a new one that you didn't know about before. But I, I make mention of you in my prayers, and I heard, I heard that you love Jesus and that you love all the believers. Now he's setting the stage, isn't he? If you love all the believers, and Onesimus are a believer, then what ought you to do toward Onesimus? I really do know how to use grammar. I just do it wrong sometimes to get people's attention. These girls are looking horrifying to me. You know you can't use it. <laughs> That uh, anyway, <laughs> if you know, if you love all the believers and Onesimus is a believer, then what are you going to do toward Onesimus? You'll love him, right? Okay, so now Paul's about to introduce him to the newest believer, the latest, the newest. <laughs> he said, goes on to say this. He said that the communication of thy faith, I pray, I pray for you. I hear about you, and here's why I pray that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now here Paul hits him with the whammy. It's the zinger. I mean honestly, this is the this is the TKO, the KO punch that's coming up because the fact of the matter is, Paul said, what I'm praying is that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Literally, if Philemon does not practice that which he preaches and professes. That is, if he uh, is known to have love of all the saints, and that's his testimony, and that's what makes him effective, if there's one saint which Philemon does not love, then all of that, all that testimony, all that effectiveness has been rendered ineffective. Christian, I want to remind you about something that the devil knows very well. It isn't what you do right that hinders you. It isn't what you do right that hinders you. It's what you do wrong that will be your hindrance. People know it when they don't love the Lord too, don't they? You know, it's amazing. There are some people that seem gifted in pushing buttons to trigger you. You know what I'm talking about? They just... Dun, 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 dun. And I mean, they do the most awful, ungodly, indisputably wicked things. And they just keep doing them and doing them and doing them or saying and saying them until you say one thing the wrong way or say one wrong thing. And then what does the issue become? It's no longer about... I mean, I'm serious. People commit adultery and if you yell at them when you uh, talk to them about it, you know, you lost your temper with me. That's the way the devil is too. He's the accuser of the brethren. Friend... Philemon evidently has a great reputation. He evidently has great leadership ability. I mean, he's, I'm not talking about leadership ability, humanly speaking. I'm talking about he's affecting people's lives. The word effectual was used. Paul said, I'm praying that you would be effectual. But he's going to remind Philemon that things that come into our lives can very, very quickly derail us. Now, I just want to say this. Don't let the Satan, the accuser, keep you derailed if you get off. You say something wrong, apologize. You respond wrong, do everything you can to make it right. Backtrack. And then get back to the issue. Don't let the devil just box you in or hold you in a corner or make this what you're all about. It's the way the world is, it's the way the media is, it's the way the devil is. Try to get one thing said wrong to you, and then all of a sudden, everything that you do that's effective is just cast aside as though it were not. So Philemon is being reminded of this, and then uh, we get right into verse 7. The Scripture says, For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. And now here's the wherefore. So what this all means is, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being as one 
such a one in one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And so now Paul sets the tone. He tells him, this is the manner that I'm talking to you. Now I could enjoin you, or I could command you, or I could obligate you to do something I'm about you to ask you for. But instead I'm going to beg you, or I'm going to beseech you to do what I'm about to ask you for. Now here's the deal. Probably on the basis of, first, his apostolic spiritual authority, secondly, the personal debt which Philemon owes Paul, as well as the position Paul is in to really make a mess out of Philemon's life. Paul could probably have gotten Onesimus restored as a servant. Have you ever been in a situation where you got what you were supposed to get but the people giving it to you weren't very happy about it. I don't want to eat at a restaurant that way. Let's put it that way. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Devin and I, this is like a month ago, more than a month ago, isn't it, We went to Port Charlotte to get a motor for Nick's boat. Yeah, yeah we went to get a motor for Nick's boat. On the way back, Devin's on the clock, by the way. This, we're, we're, he gets to ride with me and get paid for it by Brother Nick at the same time. So on the way back, there's a Sonny's Real Pit Barbecue. We don't have a Sonny's down here anymore. And they have all-you-can-eat ribs. And it was the day of the eclipse, the solar eclipse. And we went into Sonny's, and everybody is just looking at the ceiling. Uh, I think that they looked at the sun earlier and become blinded. But uh, we went in, and I, when I say everybody, I'm talking like all three of them. All three of the people working there, and there was one customer who had already was already basically taken care of and served. Nobody. Big Sonny's restaurant. And nobody's in there. And so Devin and I went in there. We got called honey because we were up in Central Florida and that sort of thing. And we went and sat down, washed our hands, did a couple things. And, and then we ordered ribs. Normally when they feed you all you can eat ribs, they take a look at a guy my size and they're just like, okay, we got to get a game plan for how to deal with this guy. You know, because you know he, he can put away a lot of ribs. So what they do first of all is they try to fill you up on appetizers or something first. You know, they bring you out. You want some extra garlic bread, you know, because garlic bread's cheaper than ribs are. And then they try to, you know, get you to drink a lot of tea and they stall you for a while while you're drinking tea and eating your garlic bread or whatever. And then they bring you like three ribs and then tell you, let me know if you want more. Well, I always say as soon as they bring them out, yeah, I'm going to want some more. You know, like just go ahead and you know, let them know, I'm going to want some more ribs. Well, they didn't do that at this Sonny's, did they, Devin? No. We were nice to them, and guess what they did for us? They had no customers. They'd already cooked their ribs. The Eclipse eclipsed their business or something, and so they had all these ribs. They came out, I'm telling you, they stacked them on there. Like, you know, like, wow, you know, we got some ribs. And, I mean, like a plateful was like, Definitely not like a Chick-fil-A portion. Let me just put it that way. Okay. <laughs> I always joke about Chick-fil-A that uh, there's, I don't have anything against their food. It's just that I don't really call it. It's more like a snack or an hors d'oeuvre when you eat a Chick-fil-A. You know, you go in there and they say it's an extra thick, extra juicy uh, chick, chicken uh, breast sandwich. But the actual fact of the matter is, is that anytime I eat a Chick-fil-A, I go home and eat afterward. It's just not really more than just, it's, you know, I'm not saying it's bad food, I'm just telling you, it's just not really a meal. So, this son is like, one plate was like a meal, and that I would acknowledge as a meal. I mean, seriously, a meal when we're planning on being gluttons, right, Devin? And uh, matter of fact, I think the one plate was more than Devin could eat. Uh, now, let me just put it to you this way. One of the things you do not want to do when you go to a place like that is be mean to the server. You could have a terrible server, and it's a good idea to be nice to them. Why? Well, because somehow they find out a way to get the food which has scraped the floor the most or which has been burnt the worst or whatever. I've just found out that how you treat people oftentimes has to do with how you're treated. You know what I'm talking about? So if you're very pleasant, very kind, and they like you, you might just get a heaping stack of ribs. And that's what we got. We got a heaping stack of ribs. I think I'll probably never go to that Sunny's ever again because I just have such a positive vibe about the place that I don't want to ruin it by ever. <laughs> yeah, there's just no way it could ever be that good again. So anyway, probably better just never eat at Sunny's at all again. That way it just end, end well, you know. 
sort of bittersweet, if you will. Anyway, so if you're Onesimus and Paul's writing a letter for you, and he's saying, I'm going to ask you, I'm about to entreat you something. Now, would you like Paul to enjoin Philemon? That is, obligate him or let him know he better do it or there's going to be consequences? Or would you rather beseech him and have him do it out of the goodness of his heart? Tell you how how the response would be. Tosh, stand up. Okay, can you be Philemon? Stand about halfway down the aisle, and I'll be kind of like the prodigal Onesimus, right there, right there. That's good. But you do look kind of like Philemon in my mind's eye, just a little bit. So okay, so I'm Onesimus, and I ran away from Philemon, and Philemon has uh, been written about my conversion, and he's also been written about his obligated debt, what he owes Paul, and about how that, you know, the world's going to hear about it if he abuses or mistreats me, and so I'm coming home. Okay? So I'm coming home, I'm Onesimus, and I'm just kind of like, what's up? What's up? Okay. Sorry, man. Sorry I took your stuff, ran away, burned your house down, <laughs> beat your kid. <laughs> Y'all good? Good. good, man? Good. For real? Yep. Okay. All right. We're not really good, are we? No. It's like, he's got to let me back, and I've got to do that. Okay. Now, Paul has beseeched. You're like this one. No, I'm not. <laughs> okay. Paul has beseeched Philemon to forgive Onesimus, and I'm coming home. And he's sort of like the prodigal father. He's prayed for me to be saved before, but he's kind of prayed it with imprecations. How do you how do you do imprecatory with a verb? Anyway, it's been an imprecatory prayer. He's prayed for me, right? But I got saved, and I and he got beseeched. He got written a letter, and he found out I got saved, and all the stuff I took, I'm bringing back actually. Okay, so he's getting his stuff back. But more than anything else, we used to be kind of close until I betrayed him, took his stuff, beat his kid, burned his house down. And now we're going to be friends again. So he's outside, and I'm coming down the road. If you're Philemon, would you rather Paul enjoined you or beseeched you? Beseeched. If you're Onesimus, would you rather Paul enjoined or beseeched? Beseeched. See, friend, there's a right way to do things, even when things are wrong. When things have been wrong, there's a right way uh, to respond and deal with things. And this is one of the best patterns. I am so thankful that this letter is in the Scripture. I mean, honest truth is, I wish there wasn't a letter about one believer wronging another in the Scripture in the sense of what actually happened because these aren't made up events. This isn't a story that's written for an, for an illustration so that people know this actually happened. These are real life people. There's real hurt. There's real pain. There's real emotion. This is a real situation. And so we want to understand or one of the things that's helpful for us to understand that man, God puts these kind of things in His Word because we live a real life where things just a lot of times are just wrong. But there's a, there is a right way, there's God's way of making things right. So then Paul said in verse 9, Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, because I'm your senior, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He said, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Now he uses the phrase, my son Onesimus. So he is very, very plainly letting Philemon know in a very kind way that Onesimus is his son. Now one thing you don't do with anybody is mess with their kid, right? And that's the way it is spiritually as well. And that's one of the things. Now Paul, that's not a threat that Paul is saying, but he is pointing out 
that there is not a disparity in value or in the person of Onesimus. Onesimus is not a slave in your master. You know, I'm not Paul the prisoner of Jesus Christ and Onesimus is the slave of Philemon and so being a prisoner of Jesus is better. You know, she says, he's my son, my son in the faith. It is not a, it is not a term of this person is last. This, it's, it's a term of this person is very, very valued, very, very precious to me. Okay, so he said, my son, uh, that which I begot my bonds, in verse 11, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Paul said, you know, in time past, he was no good. You know, aren't you glad that God changes people? You say, well, pastor, there's a real good reason Onesimus is no good. He was a slave. You know what? He might have been no good before he was a slave. In other words, he was unprofitable. You don't know the circumstances, the things that would have led for him to be a slave of Philemon, but the fact of the matter is he wasn't worth anything. He wasn't worth what was invested in him. He was unprofitable. And Paul said God has changed him, and now he's profitable to you and to me. He's worthwhile. Now, friend, there's a flip perspective here that we need to consider. You know, a lot of times when we think about things like like uh, servants and so forth, we want to think of ourselves in terms of being the one who served. But the fact of the matter is, is that as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's more what we can relate to than being masters. We ought to more naturally relate to being servants than masters. It ought to matter to us what our testimony is. And if you're begotten son of God, or I'm sorry, an adopted son of God because of what Jesus Christ has done for you, you ought to want a testimony just like Onesimus. Now listen to me just for a second. Onesimus is still serving. He didn't get saved and now he's free. He didn't have to serve anybody or anything. But I'm going to tell you something. Onesimus, when he was a slave, and maybe perhaps an unwilling slave, he was worthless. And now he's born again and Paul said he's profitable. It's amazing what a little difference in perspective will do for you. You say, well, Pastor... You know, I just don't. I just think he should have been set free. Well, Jesus took care of that for sure, for certain. You know, a lot of times in life, circumstances are far less than ideal. And you know, many many Christians get caught up with the second lie of Satan, which is that life is not fair, and so don't go with the flow. I'm not saying we go along with evil or injustice, my friend. But if you can find your worth, if you can find your peace in the person of Jesus Christ, life can be great. Some weeks ago, we were with the teenagers talking about looking at the life of Joseph. And you want to talk about somebody that just had everything in his life unjust as a youth. Everything in Joseph's life was wrong. You say, Pastor, he was his father's favorite. That was a bad thing too, actually. He had a terrible family. He had a family that hated him enough to kill him. He was his father's favorite son. He was an heir of promises, really. And he was sold as a slave to Egypt. Went into Potiphar's house. He was not rightfully a slave. He was wrongfully sold to be a slave. And in Potiphar's house, he worked so hard that he became the head of the household. And Potiphar didn't know anything that he had except for the food, that, the bread that, that he ate. That's all Potiphar knew about what he had because he trusted Joseph so implicitly. And Potiphar's wife did Joseph wrong and betrayed him and lied about him. And Potiphar, who should have known better, had him thrown in prison. And while he's in prison, he's in prison uh, with a, a bunch of criminals or people that have done wrong. And he becomes the basically the prison boss. I mean, the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of everything and everybody, so much so that the keeper of the prison didn't know what he had in his hands. I'm just telling you, most people wouldn't have responded that way. And then he helps some guys out, gives them some truth, and he asks them a favor to remember me, and they forgot Joseph. In the end, he ends up being the second man in the kingdom 
to Pharaoh. But I'll tell you what it meant for Joseph to be the second man in Pharaoh's kingdom. It meant he was the most important slave. He was still a slave. And I've asked people before, would you rather be Joseph or would you rather be free? And I'll tell you what I'd rather. I'd rather be a free man than Pharaoh's number one guy if you're a slave. And that's what Joseph was in Egypt. And then his brothers have the audacity, not on purpose, to come to him. After his father dies, his brothers come to him and appeal to him not to kill him. In spite of the way he's always... I mean, just look at Joseph's life, and it was one injustice after another. But there's a phrase all the way through the account of the Scripture of Joseph's life, and that is that the Lord was with Joseph. Yeah. The Lord was with Joseph. And folks, listen to me very carefully. Your circumstances are very, very much secondary to the truth. The Lord is with you. Regardless of how you stand in man's economy, if the Lord's with you, my friend, you're nothing less than a child of the king. And that's where Onesimus now stands in this account. And all of a sudden, it doesn't matter to him that somebody owns him or that somebody's done whatever. Now he said, I just want to serve God. And you know, there's Paul, serve him. Paul said, I would have retained him, verse 13, with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. Paul said, I thought about just keeping him because you really should be taking care of me right now, and he's doing it instead, and that's, that's right and fitting. In verse 15 now, Paul asks for restoration. Verse 15, For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, but thou shouldest receive him forever. Look at verse 16. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved. Especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And friend, here we find that in Jesus Christ, my friend, there are no, there are no slaves and there is no bond, there is no free, the Bible says. There's nobody that's a slaveholder or a slave uh, or a slave because in Jesus Christ we're brethren. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Now Paul has beseeched Philemon here. He said, I'm asking you to receive him. But I'm not asking you to receive him as your slave. I'm asking you to receive him as your brother. And my friend... It's one of the greatest pictures of a restoration you could possibly find. Because what was Onesimus to Philemon before he wronged him? He was a slave. And what was Onesimus after being restored? A brother. He was, yeah, he was unprofitable and profitable. Before that he was a servant, and now he's a brother. My friend, all I can say about that is that that's what Jesus does. That's the kind of thing Jesus does. Let the, what does the Bible say? The um, rich and that is made low, or rejoice with the poor, and that is exalted in the riches that is made low. I can't remember the passage of Scripture now. That's Sunday night, that's the way it goes. Let's get back to the Scripture and we'll finish it. Paul said, If thou therefore count, if thou count me therefore a partner, verse 17, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee ought, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand, I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, even thine own self besides. So Paul said, I'll make it right to you if you don't have the right attitude about this. I'll, I'll settle it with you. I'll, make it, I'll pay it for, for you. I'm just, I want to remind you. I'm not going to say it that you owe me yourself and everything else, but, you know, oh, I just said it. <laughs> Verse 20, Yea, brother, let me have the joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. And then he goes on to finish or conclude by saying, you know, I know enough about you that you're going to do the right thing. You ever talk to somebody, this is the way you want to talk to them, my friend. You start off by saying, I pray, to, I pray for you. I'm, I'm concerned for your testimony. I want you to be effective. I want, God, I want to see God do great things in your life. Now here's something uh, that you could do for the Lord. This is something that, a way that things could be better or things could be restored. And in the end, after that, you finish by saying, I know you're going to do the right thing. I'm confident you'll do the right thing. Give people the benefit of the doubt. And that's precisely what Paul does. You know, I think sometimes Christians, 
not sometimes, most of the time, Christians won't even talk to somebody because they're confident they'll do the wrong thing. I don't know how many times people say, no, I say, would you talk to them about it? I always ask people, would you talk to them about it? It's no use talking to them about it. They ain't going to do it. I'm not going to talk to them about it. We, they, they know. You ever hear that, my friend? That's no kind of a Christian attitude. If you as a beloved brother are going to help somebody with accountability, you need to go to them with the confidence that I'm talking to you because I believe you're going to do right. You're going to do right. I'm asking you to do right, and I believe that you will. Conclusion. Paul said, With all prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. And then he concludes with some conclusions. There salute the Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. Grace for our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And so he's written from Rome to Philemon by Onesimus, a servant, except for the part where Paul said, I've written it with my own hand. By Paul, I've written it with my own hand. Friend, here we find a perfect example of the grace that's in Jesus Christ and the ability of God to change people. God's ability to respond correctly. And we see the way that an appeal ought to be made from one believer to another or even for another. I didn't mention this, but I think it does help to be mentioned that sometimes it's helpful for a third brethren to appeal to another on the behalf of another if they have the means to do so if they have the right to do so or they have built the relationship with the person in order to do it. And my question for you this evening is, in the average lifetime of a believer, don't you think that this is the sort of thing that ought to be done appropriately at least a few times? I mean, it's too bad, isn't it, that sometimes things go wrong between people? But don't you think that you ought to be able to say, you know something, I believed God about that, and I did it the way God's Word said, and it works. God's way works. And this is how to resolve a conflict as a believer. Father, I pray that you would help us to believe this, practice it, and we'd be better for it. Lord, in this ministry, help us to restore with the same grace and with the same spirit, Lord, having been besieged rather than enjoined. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Choir practice, Charlie, who's required? <coughs>